Well, the Whitehall studies blew my mind. Um, Whitehall is, stands for Whitehall Street, which is where the British secret, see, British, <laughs> there's a Freudian slip to begin. I was gonna say British Secret Service is, where is it? The British Civil Service is sort of located there. Um, perhaps there's been some infiltration. Uh, and what they did is they, there were two large studies that took, actually the first one began in the late 60s, but then the second one in the 80s and is continuing today, where they tracked basically the, the lives and health outcomes of first, uh, I think, 10,000 and 18,000 British civil servants. And the reason they did this, of course, is because the British civil you know, service is a bit structured as one might think. It's, these are the guys with the briefcases walking down the street, right? That we pick, you know, they're, they're the stereotype we have of the British um, Secret Service, yes, civil service. And when this was, began, this study, um, I think most of us, at least in the popular press and you know, popular thinking was that the people who are dropping dead of heart attacks are those high-stressed executives, right? That's sort of, that's the stereotype. And what Whitehall showed that not only was that not the case, that the executives were living far and away longer than anybody. In fact, the folks at the bottom of the ladder were three times more likely to die than the folks at the top. Sooner, everybody uh, sooner. dies. More like, thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you for the, even, even me? Uh, the, <laughs> But what they then fa also found, though, is that there was a graded relationship depending where you were on this hierarchy. That even those second from the top were, like more, were twice as likely to die sooner, have greater mortality rate, than those at the top. So basically, as you go up the, the ladder, or the pyramid, the longer life, the better health you have. And they began this with car looking at heart disease, but they looked at almost every disease, and they found that that gradient is everywhere. And they found that not just for, then for occupation, but it's now been studied for wealth, bar income, uh, education, you find this health wealth gradient in every country in the world. So it's not just that the rich on average, on, we're talking averages, remember, there's always an exception to the rule, but the rich on average will live longer, six, more than six years in the United States longer than the poor. And what was the theory but, about but, what was driving that? You know, well, but I just want to say yeah. first, but even middle class white folks like me can expect on average to die two years, two, between two and three years sooner than the affluent. So, the, so this is about all of us. It's not just about the poor. And that was what was so, you know, I think, you know, the big light bulb and what was so, such a breakthrough about the Whitehall studies that were done in the UK. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what were some of the ideas in terms of what was driving that. And one thing that really struck me was this idea of how much control you have over your life, whether or not you can take a break to use the restroom or have a snack. Yeah, it was, it's, you know, one of the issues is power. You know, power over or power under. If you think about a CEO, there's a lot of pressure in the CEO's life. But the CEO gives orders, doesn't take orders. The CEO has lots of folks to give him or her advice, to ask for help, a lot of support. The CEO gets lots of strokes, has dinner with the rich and powerful. Um, and when all is over, gets to take their sailboat to Aruba or wherever, <laughs> you know? And, you know, and and as you go down that ladder, what happens is the ability, the, the arena we have, I think, to exercise control over our lives, be it at our job, or be it just worrying from, go, you know, going from paycheck to paycheck, worrying about whether or not one's house, you're gonna make your mortgage payment, whether or not you're gonna have enough food in the refrigerator, or at the job, how much control you have over your job, all of that takes a toll on your organs. And we now, it's interesting, beginning to understand how. Tony can talk about this as a doctor much better than I can, but the point is, is we don't believe in magic, right? There's got to be a way in which the outside, our social and economic environment, can get into the inside. We know how toxics do it, you know, how pollutants do it, but how can our social and economic environments be actually toxic? Well, they can. They can actually basically do among a number of ways in which it can happen, but one of which is triggers the, which you're getting at is the stress response. That old fight or flight response that we all learned about when we were, you know, in biology class in high school. You know, when the tiger jumps out from behind the rock, you go, oh my God, you know, and your 
heart starts to pump, your blood pressure goes up, blood sugar flows through your, through your, you know, through your bloodstream. Also, you can fight or flight, <coughs> fight or fl flee. Mm -hmm. Then the tiger goes away and you go back to normal. But what happens if you're constantly on alert, if you're constantly in a world that's uncertain, if you don't know whether or not your plant is going to shut down or be there tomorrow, if your 401k might disappear, if you're worried about your kid and whether he or she is safe at night, what happens is that these sort of drip, drip, drip of this cortisol and epinephrine flooding through the system apparently wears, takes wears down your organs.